Hi guys, Tony here. Today we've got on the podcast Victor Matos, who comes from the SD Wellness Center over in the Dominican Republic. It's the most comprehensive functional medicine center over there. In this episode, we're gonna be talking about IGF-1 and its precursor growth hormone, also related peptides, and just discussing the pros and cons, because it really is a double-edged sword. Are you familiar with IGF-1 and IGF-1 LR3? Oh yeah, well, it- I'm quite familiar with both and and we can talk about one and the difference in using the LR3 is the potency is a hundred times more potent. So um, so if you go over the IGF-1, the, the, the effect of the IGF-1 is the same effect of GH, but you don't involve the, um, the hypothalamus on that equation. So the only difference between the um, LR3 is the potency. One is a hundred times more potent than the other one. Okay. So um, like going into the, um, Potential side effects of both, yes. So let me tell you, I I don't like to use it in my practice. Let me tell you why. Um, it it it's a great the way if you see it um, superficially, it's a great um, peptide we can say because it's it's a peptide uh, hormone. Um, that can enhance enhance um, cells grow. So it will give you the muscles. Um, it will increase the metabolism as well. So you will probably lose weight. Um, it will also reduces, and this is one important thing. It reduces the production of myostatin. Uh, so okay. you lose muscles. So it can be used in elderly patients. But since IGF-1 or, or IGF-1 LR, um, LR, sorry, 3 um, can increase cell division and can improve um, cell uh, growth, it can also stimulate cancer. Hmm. And there's another thing that since you're using and stimulating the production. I prefer IGF-1 um, instead of GH. And I can tell you um, clinically and metabolically why. Um, GH uses the uh, uh, some residual embryonic cells, which is called B cells, very small cells. So B cells are uh, very small embryonary cells. So, so like stem cell, cells, right? Th- yes, th- yeah. those are like the grandmother cells. Right. So stem cells is the mother, B cells are the grandmother cells. So these are cells that remain in your body since you, since you are an embryonic cell. So um, this, why we have these cells, these cells are, are used by our body to stimulate uh, angiogenic uh, production, to stimulate some uh, uh, progenitors like endothelial progenitors. And if you use this GH, if you inject your GH, then your body uses more and more and more of the very small embryonic cells, residual cells, and your body doesn't produce those cells. So if you waste those cells because you want more muscles and you want to look a great skin, um, then when your body needs those cells, when he needs it, you probably won't have reserve of those cells. And if you have a heart condition, 
Like if you have a arteriosclerotic heart um, coronary condition, then the thing that saves you when you have a heart attack, when you have an infarction due to an arteriosclerotic disease, mm. is that is because you create collateral uh, blood vessels. So what really saves people in a heart attack, in a, in a myocardial infarction, is the collateral that your body in time will create because your body will know that your arteries are getting blockage. So you it will create collateral vessels, collateral arteries inside the heart. And when the infarction comes, those collateral arteries will give some flow to the rest of, your, of the heart. If you waste those embryonary cells, then your body will, your body will lose the regenerative capacity. Right, yeah, that makes sense. So those embryonic stem cells, they're there as you get older, which because heart disease basically affects pretty much everyone. So as you get older, and so you really want to have those stem cells available as you get older. So GH uses those cells. GH is the trigger to use those cells because your body, that's the signal that uses to tell, hell, hey, um, there is something wrong around here, like in the heart or the brain or whatever, whatever your body needs to regenerate, it will send a signal using GH to the bone marrow and the bone marrow will release the very, or will stimulate the very small embryonary cells to produce uh, endothelial, cells or fibroblastic cells, any other cells that your body will require for regeneration. So if you waste those cells, then you probably won't have the uh, reserve to save you in a critical state. Okay. So then, that's the reason why I prefer IGF right, yeah. instead of GH, but IGF can be related to some forms of cancer. Yeah, because that's what I hear. So, like, some people will take drugs to stimulate more growth hormone than IGF one, and then, yeah. but then there's obviously there's side effects to that too. So, and then you're saying IGF one can increase the risk of cancer. So, yes. um, so what would you say if you were to do? Because then that gets me onto something like more of a mainstream one, like samorolin. Say if your IGF one levels are on the the lower end, and you were to do a small amount, do you think? Because obviously that increases both got IGF one and growth hormone, doesn't it? The problem is that um, I, I don't know if you have um, if ha that has happened in Europe, uh, but you know IGF, apamoralin, sermoralin, tensormoralin, all, all those peptides. Um, hasn't been approved yet. So the clinical trials and the evidence is so low, so reduced and so over the counter that under the counter, sorry, so under the counter that um, we don't know. Have I used IGF-1 in patients? Yes. Have I used sermoralin in patients? Yes. And my experience with sermoralin, to be honest, is amazing and uh, right now sermoralin it's a excellent drug in in my opinion uh, but we know that the the actual facts and the actual scientific facts are not there we don't have it yet mm. so um in terms of doses since there are not many evidence we don't know exactly the dose. We know that um, maybe uh, sermoralin has been linked to um, cure the scar in the heart after a myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. So um, we also know that increases the bone density, um, probably will stimulate 
um, more blood vessels in the brain. And I know that it reverses dementia, but the cases, yes, so Marlene, but the cases um, also reduce uh, seizures. But in the cases that we um, had used sermarlin, we have to make them sign um, first an NDA and secondary a non-responsibility agreement because um, it's because they have no more option. So we we um, we have used uh, sermarlin not too much, but in the cases that I have used at Marlene, um, the, uh, the effects and what I want to see has been great. Um, right now, we have a program here in our clinic that um, it's called Brain Awakening. We use that program. We put into that program patients that came out of ICU with brain damage from probably a stroke or a bleeding or whatever any, we also- or lack of that. oxygen and stuff like that. Yeah, we, we normally patients that came out of ICU, you know, I'm a, I'm a critical care specialist. So I have a lot of patients after ICU. My, um, my practice right now has been uh, directed to the post ICU patients. So, um, so we see a lot of patients that the medicine, the conventional medicine doesn't have much to offer. So I use, uh, I use this kind of peptides in those patients and the results has been amazing. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've done some more than myself. Um, this is like last year and then um, I didn't measure my IGF-1 levels. It's quite prohibitive in the UK because the testing is much more expensive for IGF-1 um, testing than in, say, America. So, But that's something I, I do want to get my levels checked. So I, I think even doing small amounts of it, I noticed a significant improvement in things like sleep and recovery. But then because I don't know my levels, I don't know how low they are naturally. But then, as you say, I don't want to increase them too much if I was to do another cycle of it I'd have to be very wary because if I'm longevity minded I don't want to you know deplete stem cells and things like that or increase my risk of cancer so it's a very kind of fine balance between being healthy and um, obviously and then increasing my risk of disease yeah yeah so uh, um, there is a good combination which is the sermoraline and Ipamoraline, I don't know if you're familiar with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the combination in both is because that that's that um sermoraline works a little bit more in the uh, um GH releasing hormone analog. It, it works as a GH releasing hormone, but it stimulates the release of your own GH. And also increase the production, the regular organic production. So if you produce um, the organic production of the GH, don't, don't waste it, don't waste your heart, your B cells as much as injecting the, the own GH. And the other thing is the um, hypermoraline works more into, since it's a critical, it works more into the ghrelin production, the one that goes and tells your brain, hey, let's eat because I'm hungry. It, it, um, it blocks the receptor on ghrelin and it, it's like a ghrelin agonist. Hmm. So um, yes, it gives you the benefit of having a lot of GH, but also give you the benefit of eating less and uh, reduce weight because you're eating less and you have less anxiety for for food. Okay, and you're saying it, uh, neither of these peptides deplete your B cells as much as say with doing normal That's growth. as GH, as the somatotropin drug, no. Because remember the somatotropic works directly 
into the um, bone marrow because you're giving the own GH. With sermoralin, you're making your body to produce the needed GH. Mm. So uh, most of us after 30 don't produce not even 50% of the GH we were producing when we were, when we were 15 or 20. But um, uh, uh, your body produces a little bit more with the secretagot GH releasing hormone and all of that. Mm. So it, go, it doesn't go directly to the, to the bone marrow. It goes to the hypothalamus and passes through the pituitary gland and tells, hey, let's produce a little bit more of GH because we need it. Yeah, and that, that kind of explains why. So someone who's 30 versus someone who's 60 that does yes. um, when he's secreted or because they won't get the same benefits because they have less growth hormone, um, less of these uh, re releasing GRH, um, you know, releasing kind of uh, hormones to be able to actually work with it rather than just using if you're older, then that's why I think they recommend doing, if you want those growth hormone benefits, actually do HDH rather than a, a peptide instead. Yeah, of course. Hmm. Uh, the other one is tesamoraline. Uh, tesamoraline is not um, releasing hormone analog. It is a growth hormone releasing analog, which is not the same um, because the grown hormone, releasing hormone, is one step behind the hypothalamus, okay? okay? But it's, it's um, probably the results are the same. It increases the GH in your body, but increases your own GH. Mm. It's meant to be more powerful, isn't it, from what I've gathered? It is more powerful as yeah. well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we've really covered that. Hi guys, to help out the channel, do think about investing in your health and buying one of these tests I have available. And yes, I'm sure a lot of viewers do like to invest in supplements, but not so many into diagnostics. And it's a bit like a Formula One team buying modifications for their car and having no data to see how it's working. Check out these short videos again, overview of all the data that you'll be getting.